I'm uh, Mike Perry. I'm the executive director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. And tonight we're pleased to have Colonel Keith Nightingale back for a second time, but this time talking a, on a different subject. Colonel Nightingale grew up in the small town of Ohio, California. He attended Claremont uh, Men's College and joined the ROTC program while at the college. Upon gra uh, graduation, he was commissioned in the regular army as an infantryman. After completing jump school and ranger school, he was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division, and there he decided to make the Army his career. Colonel Nightingale served two tours in Vietnam with Airborne and Ranger, both American and Vietnamese units. He commanded Airborne Battalions and later the Ranger Brigade. He was a member of the Iranian Rescue Attempt in 1981 and served with several classified organizations. He was the Assault Force Commander of both Grenada and Panama and managed the Department of Defense Counter Drug Support uh, to operations in Latin America. After 9-11, Colonel Nightingale served as a principal in the FAA Sky Marshal Training Program and has also provided corporate and technical and scientific support to the City of New York Police Department and Fire Departments as part of the 9-11 Site Recovery Programs. In 1993, Colonel Nightingale retired from the Army and accepted a job at SAIC Corporation to assist in their various technologies for border control and drug screening. At SAIC, he became the high-risk coordinator for the 2,000 plus employees that the company sent to Iran and Af uh, Afghanistan, excuse me, Iraq and Afghanistan. He served as a consultant and business evaluator for various corporations, including providing oversight of security systems, communication, and IT backbone to the Greek Olympics. Colonel Nightingale has received many honors and awards throughout his career, including the Defense Superior Service Medal, three legions of merit, five defense Meritorious Service Medals, Humanitarian Service Medal, Iran, and four Bronze Stars for Valor and the Vietnamese Medal of Honor. He is a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. Sure, good evening. I'd ask that everybody hold their questions to the end. Uh, this uh, presentation is going to be less a lecture and more a conversation uh, with Colonel Nightingale. Evening, sir. Can you hear us? I've got you fine. Thank okay. you very much. Evening, sir. Uh, tonight's subject is the uh, the invasion of Granada and how it affected uh, the development of joint doctrine. Um, we'd like to start off with the background. What was the background on the invasion of Grenada? Why why did uh, what had occurred in the country that caused the U.S. to have any interest in in going to that small island nation? Well, uh, about a year before the invasion, which was October of uh, '83. Uh, actually 1979, the uh, British protectorate, which was a democracy in Grenada, uh, was overthrown by a guy by the name of Maurice Bishop. Uh, and he instituted a socialist style of government there. Uh, they all, he also began to encourage the Cubans to come in and provide him uh, additional support uh, they created a uh, beginning of an international airfield at uh, the tip of gr the major island, Grenada, uh, about uh, a point Celine is what it was called. And it was a true international long distance uh, airport, which the U.S. military gauge was capable uh, of supporting MiGs. And at that time, uh, Castro was very much engaged in developing operations in Central America. And Grenada was used as kind of a, uh, viewed as a potential jumping off point for the Cubans to go from Grenada into Central America, you know, write whatever scenario you want. Uh, <clears throat> at that point, uh, loose instructions were given independently to both Atlantic Command and Joint Special Operations Command to consider drafting some light plans, if you would, uh, if we had to go into Grenada. Uh, all was fine until uh, very early in October of 83 when uh, a guy by the name of Bernard Cord overthrew Bishop. And he, with his uh, general slash head thug, uh, General Austin, took over from Grenada. 
and uh, from the, the Bishop government. And at that point, they began to sequester the U.S. Uh, medical school personnel that were there. Uh, the uh, U.S. had a private medical school in Grenada established that was built just north of Point Celine. And this attracted a lot of expat U.S. and others for med school. Uh, Bishop, uh, excuse, excuse me, Cord, uh, put all of these people under basically house arrest and curfew. And the students began calling their parents and the uh, administration in the United States. You know, we have this problem, we're locked in, we got guards every night, they threatened to kill us if we walk out of the barracks. Uh, and so this became quite a point within the State Department uh, the president of the medical school had gone to Connecticut for a fundraising, and he was in constant contact with the students and with State Department, but State did not inform defense of any of these, uh, of this particular conduit or intelligence other than in the grossest sense. And then the Beirut bombing took place where the Marine barracks were destroyed, 200 plus Marines. And this was sort of a, a perfect storm for Reagan. He had the students in danger in Grenada. And then he had the Beirut uh, Marine barracks blown up. And at that point, he, uh, the, through the JCS, General Vesey, the chairman, they issued directives for LANTCOM and JSOC to begin serious planning. And this was probably two weeks before the actual invasion, just to give you an idea of the compressed timeline. But how compressed uh, was that timeline? Uh, say, excuse me, say again? How compressed was that timeline? Well, uh, I'll give you an, I'll just use my cheat sheet here. Uh, Bishop was overthrown by Cord and Austin on the 12th of October. On the 13th of October, serious planning began with the first time additions of 18th Airborne Corps and 82nd Airborne Division, all now to be mixed in together uh, beginning on the 13th of October. The troops in the 82nd, my, uh, my units uh, included, weren't really informed that we were going to do something until about the 20th of October. We had no planning, no maps, uh, no nothing. On the 23rd, Reagan actually approved the invasion, and this was concurrent with the Beirut bombing in the barracks. The invasion took place on the 25th of October. So you can see how compressed that was. Uh, there was roughly two weeks where JSOC and LANTCOM were introduced to each other. And then 18th Airborne Corps was added into the mix. Uh, the, G, uh, the G3 of the 82nd uh, finally joined the planning program about seven days before the invasion itself. And the concept at this time, because of the confusion, was to keep it most simple. Marines would land in the north and seize the northern portion of the island and Pearl's airfield and the larger northern island uh, called Karyaku. JSOC would add of everything south of that to include the Grand Aunts Beach campus of the Medical Institute. And unbeknownst to uh, them was the fact that there was another entire campus south of Point Saline. Uh, had State Department and the president of the college been in, con in concert with Department of Defense, the Rangers and all would have known that, but that did not occur. Uh, this. So this was not the original plan, was it? This was a compromise plan? Uh, that, that's correct. Uh, the original plan was 
Jay Sock would go in and uh, seize Point Celine and rescue the students, period. The additional plan was Lant would now go in and be in charge of the entire operation with JSOC tied to them. And then JSOC would depart 18th Airborne Corps slash 82nd would come in as both reinforcing and substituting uh, force where Lantcom could depart, JSOC could depart, and Corps would take over the remainder of the work. That was sort of the plan, but it morphed daily, and I would emphasize that point. There was no solid plan going in. It was very clear to us that there was a lot to be sorted out on the ground once we got there, and those basically were instructions. Show up, you'll get instructions. It's not, that's not a good way to plan, is it? <laughs> no. Well, not at that level, certainly. At the infantry task force level, you can deal with it. Uh, but at the larger level, no, it was uh, made, you know, there were major issues that immediately became apparent. There was no joint CEOI. We didn't know how to talk to each other. Marine ground could not talk to Ranger ground. Uh, satellite communication was the only one on the command net, and that became very crowded in a hurry. Uh, Army aviation could not land on Navy ships. There was no plan for that. They couldn't talk to each other. Uh, there was no handoff plan between the Rangers and uh, the 82nd. That was just sorted out on the ground, essentially, between Colonel Taylor, the range, Ranger Force Commander, uh, Jack Hamilton, the initial two, uh, second of the 325 uh, support commander, and General Trobal. Uh, so there was a number of major issues, not the least of which was the lack of intelligence and the lack of maps. I mean, we went into Grenada with black and white maps, shell overprints, and anything 18th Airborne Corps could magic up from their resources. So you were a battalion commander of the 2nd Battalion, 505th Infantry at the time. How much were you aware of the planning and were you involved in the planning uh, development at all? Well, I had an edge in that before I took over command of the 2505, uh, I was in the operational aspects of JSOC uh, and our op operational office in uh, DESOPS. Pentagons. So I had a little bit of understanding what was going on before I showed up. Uh, because of my clearances, uh, I was liaisoning back and forth between JSOC uh, and the division and monitoring the initial conversations. Uh, but from a vanilla viewpoint, uh, the 82nd really was not even aware it was going to Grenada until about five days before uh, the initial battalion deployed. How did that affect the logistical planning? Uh, the logistical planning? Yes. <laughs> Wasn't there any? <laughs> well, uh, an oxymoron at that point. Uh, you went in with what was in your rucksack. Uh, understanding at uh, Green Ramp at Fort Bragg, it was like literally maybe uh, 20, uh, was well, <clears throat> it was averaging 20 degrees and it got down to zero uh, the evening we were at Green Ramp. Uh, so everybody had on their uh, chemical protective overgarments. Uh, everything that was warm that could be found was worn, and the troops overloaded. I mean, we knew we were going to Grenada, a tropical place. Well, what do we need to take? Well, there was no real definition. What's our basic load going to be? Well, we'll just take what's the standard basic load and sort it out from there. So the troops went through the ASP, and they got loaded up with their real basic load for planning. Uh, but we had no real jungle capacity, no special, uh, you know, and you had no mosquito nets or uh, other kind of jungle-oriented things like we had in uh, Vietnam. 
was just whatever you got, you packed it, you took it with you. That was the- Also pre night vision goggle distribution widely across the force, isn't it? Say again? This is pre NVG, night vision goggle. That's correct. We, we had uh, a very few amount of NVGs and I don't really recall taking them with us to Grenada. So you provided us a bunch of uh, images. What was your battalion mission when you went into the country? Uh, land, talk to the division CP and uh, the brigade commander who had just landed ahead of me, Colonel Scott, 3rd Brigade, and we'll sort it out from there. Uh, we landed around midnight. Uh, this was at the day after the invasion. Uh, raging fun, a tropical storm. Uh, we hunkered up, and this is where the first major problems began. Uh, the airport itself, unbeknownst when the invasion began, could only support a single C-141 at a time. Uh, General Trobaugh was given the choice to jump in the division ready force or air land it. Uh, he had been told that the Rangers had secured the runway, so he felt that rather than take jump casualties, being very short uh, drop zone on each side of the runway, that he would air land. Well, what that meant was that it took about 45 minutes in the time a single C-141 would land until it took off and the second one could come in. Well, that totally scrambled the Air Force's program, which was predicated on drop aircraft. Everybody would jump and then the aircraft empty would recover and fuel wherever they could. Well, now they had to scramble and go to a half a dozen different locations just to set down and refuel. So the whole order of uh, ingress into Grenada was disrupted. Uh, you know, a company would land and then a unit from Corps would land and then a signal unit would land and then a ranger support element would land. It was very incoherent. Uh, my entire battalion was not assembled until about 8.30 the following morning. Uh, this is from midnight to 8.30 it took to infiltrate my task force. Uh, we were then march ordered uh, with all three of our battalions, the first and second of the 05 and the first of the 508, and basically just told to uh, move to the uh, east and start clearing. Uh, we split the ground into three kind of separate areas of operation for the three of the battalions. Uh, and then that's where we were for about the first 48 hours. Uh, and at that point, we got what I would call a hurry up order from General Vesey who had visited with General Trobaugh and was very concerned that we weren't clearing the islands rapidly enough so the Marines could evacuate. Uh, I was given the mission to uh, redeploy by helicopter uh, to the northeast portion at Land at Pearls and replace the uh, Marine uh, Battalion Force led by Ray Smith. Uh, at Pearls and also Karyaku. So my entire battalion was airlifted up to Pearls. We sent one element north to Karyaku to replace uh, Ray's elements there and they re-embarked. And at that point, we began what I call the normal Grenada operations. Uh, if you look at that map, you'll uh, what should strike you is that the only level ground in all of Grenada is that very small road that circumnavigates the island on the seacoast. Everything else is very steep, very rugged jungle. Think of the Nepali coast in Hawaii to give you an idea. Very thick jungle and interspersed throughout the area 
are these very small villages, maybe only one or two houses or eight or nine houses. And they're there supporting the uh, nutmeg, the cocoa, and the banana crops that grow essentially wild inside the interior. What we found very quickly was we had a small firefight in Cariacou in one of the supporting islands. There's eight islands that make up the Grenadian chain. And my battalion had to clear all of those uh, islands to the north. Meanwhile, 1505 took about a third of the island and 1508 took the other third of the main island. And we started working our way north with me operating with one third of the uh, northeastern section uh, to secure. Uh, we had a small firefight with uh, what I would call Grenadian Irregulars. Uh, that was essentially it in terms of fixed forces against us. The rest of the time we just discovered what we were dealing with were thugs and criminals. Uh, what uh, Cord had done was as soon as he took over, he armed all of the uh, military age males with uh, the Cubans supplied weaponry in those big warehouses at Point Saline uh, that the Cuban engineers were defending and working on. And they had been issued uh, earlier, two weeks or so earlier. And so you had these unemployed military age males scattered throughout the island complex, essentially just committing criminal acts. They would go in and uh, they would take a couple of the girls uh, or they would grab people's food or steal their property at gunpoint. Uh, and our guys, which were now divided essentially into platoon and squad size elements in these little houses and villages around, were just in the process of figuring out who the good guys were and the bad guys. Uh, we were greatly... Uh, uh, enhanced by a uh, Irish Catholic order that was throughout the islands. And we found that the Catholic priests were the best sources of intelligence that we could find. And so in conjunction with them, we basically did a legal order of battle and just began policing up crooks and criminals. We had by the end of probably the second week 250 to 300 thugs that had been identified, witnessed, and corroborated uh, by the locals uh, as being criminal elements and whatever their crimes were. So it became, uh, I wouldn't say occupation so much as uh, security operations on behalf of the locals. Uh, the, who I would, um... Excuse me, say again. How did the public, how did the, 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 the Grenadian population react to your soldiers? Oh, we were absolutely overwhelmed uh, with gratitude. And that was one of the major uh, things that occurred very uh, early on. Uh, my battalion was crossing the runway when, uh, at first light, when the students were brought out uh, to load their aircraft to be flown home. The students saw my troops walking across the runway and they spontaneously just broke ranks and ran to the troops and began shaking their hands and thanking them and, you know, going through incredible, uh, you know, gratitude. And of course, my troops hadn't rescued them. Uh, you know, it had been the Rangers uh, that had done it. Nonetheless, you know, we got the credit, so to speak. Uh, and then as we moved out to the islands, exactly the same. The locals would come out of the woodwork and thank the troops profusely. You know, they'd bring them food, they'd bring them water, they'd just pat them on the head. Uh, you know, they were just so grateful uh, that we had shown up. And I would note that Grenada has declared their Thanksgiving was the invasion day when we all arrived. So, you know, the outpouring of uh, support and gratitude was just overwhelming. 
Well, I should know, what, what language did the uh, Grenadians speak? Uh, ironically enough, the only language they speak is English. Okay. Uh, and the PSYOP folks at Fort Bragg had not quite figured that out. And they brought down all of these language PSYOP teams and told us to assemble the village at thus and such. And they would arrive and they would begin uh, their whole broadcast in Spanish, assuming that that's what the locals spoke. Uh, spoke. And of course, the locals would just sit there looking kind of dumbfounded, you know, saying, what are these crazy Americans doing? We finally got it sorted out, but there was some uh, misinformation going around. So you provided a bunch of images. You want to uh, wander through them? Uh, sure, I can, if it uh, might be of interest. Uh, this was the basic plan. Uh, Rangers would go at Point Saline. Uh, the Marines would go to the north. Uh, and JSOC would secure uh, Fort Frederick and Richmond Hill Prison, which were considered to be primary uh, uh, nodes for Austin and, and, and Court and his people, uh, and also would liberate Sir Paul Schoon. That's where the, he was the governor general of the island had been under house arrest. And this is, you know, the famous thing in the movie where the SEAL talked on the, uh, using his AT&T credit card to direct the gunships. Uh, that took place there. Uh, one of the other major shortfalls is on this particular sh uh, map. The Rangers were scheduled to assault uh, Saline Airfield about 4.30 in the morning just before uh, morning nautical twilight. However, the Marines and the Navy did not have what they considered accurate charts of the beaches leading in uh, to their area, and they requested a landing at daylight, like at 8.30, so they could actually make out the shoals. Uh, this was an issue. Uh, Colonel Taylor lost and he had to drop in daylight. And you'll see as I have a shot here uh, later on that shows the Rangers actually jumping in broad daylight, uh, which was an issue. They took casualties and a uh, number of the C-130s got holed uh, because of the requirement to jump in daylight instead of dark. Okay. Uh, this was an air. This is a good example of an uh, of the better maps that we had. Uh, this was a map I took in uh, when I landed. It showed Point Saline, the airfield, uh, but that's about it. Didn't really give any topo features other than the grossest uh, and you know the political lines. This was actually taken uh, off of a shell map. Uh, that uh, core put together. And this is an artificial grid system here that core imposed on it. And there's also a note not shown that says not to be used for calling or adjusting fires. Did the other services have similar maps to this or was this just out of the core? Uh, we had a whole variety of maps that were distributed and there was never enough for any one, call it battalion package. Uh, I had three separate sets of maps, uh, one each of which I gave to A company or B company or C company. So each of them were operating on a different map. And then I had to, with my S3, kind of interpolate that whenever I was talking to them out in the field as to which map was being used by which company so that we could make sure that we were speaking a common language. It wasn't yeah. until later that CORE brought in uh, sufficient maps that we could all use the same edition. And we hate to say this is pre-GPS also. Pre-what? GPS? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Pre-GPS, we had no pluggers. Uh, and we never got the standard one over 50 topo maps that you're used to uh, dealing with in the military. Uh, this is a larger version of, a of the map I was issued. Uh, this was a very 
ultimately it folded out so that it was about the size of a bed sheet. Uh, but it was the best map that we had, but we never had enough of them to distribute generally. Uh, CORE turned this map into a smaller scale black and white that we, event that we eventually distributed and were able to use. Uh, this is a, a picture of the troops uh, deploying into Grenada. Uh, you can see they're just all jammed up on the 141s. They got their rucks. Uh, uh, they're sitting on their rucks, or they have them on the floor. Uh, and basically, some of these units just bored holes in the sky for 36 hours. Uh, they would took off from Bragg. They landed to refuel, they took off again, they landed to refuel, they took off again. I had elements of my uh, C company that were literally 36 hours in the airplane, either refueling or flying. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of our CP moving out uh, the first morning. Uh, that's the northeast corner of uh, Point Saline, and behind you, you can see uh, just to the left there, uh, the beginning of where the barracks uh, and warehouses were uh, that the Cubans uh, were finally held at. Uh, this is a picture I show you, you know, 8.30 in the morning, this is the Ranger Airborne Assault, taken by an Instamatic uh, south of uh, the airfield. Uh, but you can see it's fully, uh, it's fully daylight, and those are the rangers jumping at about 500 feet. What, uh, what weapons were guarding the airfield? What heavy weapons were the, on the airfield? Uh, there, was, uh, there were uh, two quad 20s and a dual 50, uh, all of which were manned and active and finally taken out by a couple of the AC-130s. Uh, but eight of the C-130s were holed uh, significantly. Uh, two of them were declared non-operational uh, when they returned, I believe, to Barbados, empty. Uh, this is a shot of the students lining up uh, behind the 141. The 141 would uh, bring in troops, offload them, and then the students uh, would be onloaded to take off. It was one airplane at a time, 45 minutes, uh, a turnaround. Um, how fast were the students evacuated? They uh, they the students were rescued. There was quite a firefight. Uh, one of the uh, Cobras was shot down and one of the CH-46s. Uh, was also shot down at the beach right next to the student billets. Uh, they were finally cleared and the students were brought in around, uh, well, I'm going to say uh, eight in the evening of D-Day and they were beginning to be evacuated in the morning of D plus one, if I have my dates correct. Uh, they were all gone by the end of D plus one. And, you know, here's the shot uh, of the students uh, with one of the 82nd uh, guards just before they departed. Uh, this is a good e example of the terrain in Grenada. If you were up in I Corps in Vietnam, it looks very much the same. Uh, rugged, rugged hills, uh, just exposed dirt along these very narrow roads and the cliffs falling off uh, into deep jungle and ravines. And our troops had to figure out what was going on up there. They went into all of this terrain following the trails. We had no, there was a rumor that the Cubans had a major force in the central area, the Grand Tang. So we were very much concerned about finding them. So the troops went on these recce missions, most of which were squad size. 
Uh, I don't think I operated above platoon after uh, D plus three. Uh, this is another shot of the terrain. Again, you get an appreciation for it. And there was a climate shock. Uh, you know, the troops were back at, this is October, Fort Bragg. It was below freezing. Uh, here it was 98 degrees with almost equal humidity. Uh, so, you know, we had hydration issues to deal with, heat exhaustion, acclimatization, but you can just see the nature of the terrain. Uh, that the guys had to deal with. Uh, we had no transportation whatsoever. Uh, my battalion, along with the others, landed with no wheeled vehicles whatsoever because of the space limitations. Uh, as a result, uh, my battalion S4 went over to the uh, warehousing area and got into the uh, Cuban motor park, all of which were uh, Soviet vehicle, uh, Soviet trucks. Uh, this is a dump truck, for example. And we took over a whole bunch of these vehicles, jump-started them, and we would assign one or two of these uh, Soviet trucks uh, to each company for logistics. I mean, you can see the island we had to figure out a way to feed the people. There was limited helicopter support. So we basically used these trucks uh, with our drivers to resupply the troops and to move uh, the prisoners back and forth, whatever was necessary. We marked them up like that uh, and uh, had a, uh, a truck parked. My warrant officer, a maintenance warrant came down and he was amazed at the nature, the difference between U.S. vehicles and Soviet vehicles. There's no maintenance done on a Soviet vehicle. It's all plug and play. Uh, this is a shot of the uh, Cuban POWs uh, in a uh, POW camp that had been uh, created out of the warehousing and the billet areas uh, that they had. Uh, after they basically surrendered to uh, the Rangers and Delta on uh, D-Day, uh, they had about, about 650, as I recall. Uh, they were, uh, you know, their weapons were taken away and they were put in uh, a confined space before they too were evacuated via Red Cross aircraft. Uh, this is a typical day. Uh, in Grenada. Uh, these are two criminal thugs that were policed up in a village and are being hauled back to central uh, processing to be managed. Uh, there was a, a pretty efficient system developed uh, with uh, local, the few local police we could find, uh, plus newly arrived Caribbean peacekeeping force personnel and professional uh, IPW teams uh, that were brought in to process these people, create a dossier, if you would, just like the police, and then turn it over uh, to what would become the new uh, Grenadian justice system, which was uh, just being developed. Uh, this is uh, my command group, myself on the left, my Canavan, my XO, and Bob Porton, or S3, uh, we only knew what we knew. And you'll see that Mike has got one map and Bob Porton has got a second map and there's also a third map down there on the ground. And we're just trying to sort out what's going on. Uh, we had good communications with the PRC-77 uh, with the extended 292 antenna and I also had a tax sat with me where I could tie into uh, the Rangers and the other uh, JSOC elements. Was your other battalion the only one with tax sat, or did the other battalions have them too? Uh, say that again, I'm sorry. Did, did some of the other units have tax sat, or was that? Yes, sort of I, I believe all of the maneuver battalions had one tax sat and operator. And that's because initially we were intermixed. Uh, JSOC was still on the island. 
Uh, the Marines were on the island in the north, and the tax set was the only way that we could actually talk to all of the elements that were players, which made it a very crowded net, but it, uh, we could talk. Uh, this is just a, an example of later newspaper articles and magazine articles that came out uh, about the operation, and this is uh, what we were doing in the island. You see, I'm talking to this one guy. Uh, we, uh, the upper picture is a uh, small firefight with some irregulars uh, out on one of the islands, uh, and it was basically just kind of uh, methodical policing up, moving around, figuring out who's the good guys, who's the bad guys, uh, and getting a taste for the population. Uh, this is a shot of General uh, Trobaugh, the division commander, and General Vesey, the chairman who visited us on uh, D plus two. And he basically wanted to get the 82nd up across the island immediately and allow Delta, JSOC, and uh, the Marines to uh, depart the island and have Corps take over the operation. Uh, which we rapidly did when uh, the 3rd Brigade uh, began moving across the northern part of the island, replacing uh, the Marines, and 2nd Brigade replaced uh, the JSOC elements. And then eventually 2nd Brigade departed and 3rd Brigade was left, and then that was whittled down to just my task force, Reinforce is basically a brigade task force departing on the 15th of December. Uh, this is an example of what would occur uh, when we would move into a village. Uh, we would land in the helicopters and the whole village would arrive to greet us. And the troops would get off in their assault mode and all the locals would come up and begin shaking their hands and kissing them and offering them pineapple, you know, or whatever. It was just a, a giant love fest. Uh, this is the Caribbean Peacekeeping Force, which is somewhat of a misnomer. Uh, the Caribbean uh, Federation was made up of all of the various islands uh, in the region, St. Kitts, Nevis, uh, Bequi, a whole bunch of them. Uh, and their contribution was police forces. Uh, they would send, you know, three guys from this island, six guys from that island. And the idea was they would eventually supplant the 82nd and they would create the nucleus of a security force, the Caribbean peacekeeping force and they would then transition uh, Grenada back into a functioning democracy. Uh, and we would also turn over all of the prisoners and the dossiers and all to them. Uh, I began receiving my load about D plus five at Pearls, and I had them immediately used to secure Pearls airfield. And then we began putting them in the, uh, what had been Grenadian police stations that of course were no longer uh, occupied by Grenadian police. Court had pretty much gotten rid of all of them. Uh, my battalion along with all the other units and engineers we got from Corps began to rehab the police stations and the schools and then we brought in the, uh, the CPF forces and, you know, two or three guys running a desk uh, would take over, say, the Grenville police station, and they would begin to work the local situation. Uh, Barbados, excuse me, Bermuda sent in a retired uh, chief of uh, prisons, and he ran Richmond Hill Prison. Uh, and this sort of thing. They just tried to match what had been uh, missing in Grenada uh, with other island forces. Uh, worked out reasonably well. Uh, this is a good example of how much the locals loved the troops. This is Thanksgiving Day. 
uh, and all over the island and all these little mixed villages, uh, the islanders came out and uh, gave food to our troops. Uh, you know, we flew in, of course, you know, th uh, the turkey and the, thing, and the cranberries and all the U.S. type stuff. And invariably, the local village honcho would come out and he'd say, look, we don't understand anything about uh, your Thanksgiving. We certainly don't understand the food, uh, but we understand Thanksgiving. And our Thanksgiving was when you guys showed up. Uh, and the impact of that on our troops was tremendous. I mean, super, super plus and positive. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it was really ma a major uh, awakening for our troops having, you know, we had just come out of Vietnam and the disgrace of the army and the lack of pride and all. Uh, this did a huge amount to restore uh, the troop pride. And I think it also did the same for the country as a whole, it put Vietnam behind us. Uh, the TV coverage we got from the U.S. media was just, you know, was overwhelming in terms of the people, the U.S. folks every evening at the news feed could see their military at work in a very, very positive manner. Uh, and I think that was one of the major pluses uh, of the uh, invasion, if you would. Uh, we left on the 15th of December, uh, and this is at Point Celine, uh, the morning before we departed. I just went around to each company and sort of tried to encapsulate what they had done and what it meant, uh, not only for the people of Grenada, but I also believe for, you know, the Army and the military as a whole. So we... Uh in the title of the, uh, the talk, we talked about uh, this being a impetus for the development of joint doctrine. Would you like to talk a little bit about that and, and maybe your involvement? Well, yeah, what the uh, Gr Grenada became a point of investigation for Capitol Hill. Uh, they didn't quite understand the confusion. They heard a lot about things that didn't go well. They wanted to know what was going on and why. Uh, they had a open, uh, a open sessions where the service chief said, well, you know, we had some minor tweaks to make, no big deal, you know, don't change anything, we'll fix it. Uh, well, then a number of the senators, Nunn and Cohen, got backdoor briefings from some of the principal participants, General Schultes primarily, and learned, began to learn for the first time what kind of a disaster it was in terms of planning and how tenuous it would have been had there been really strong opposition. Well, their staffers then began to do a lot of work and found a lot of errors and programs and lack of interest really within the services and making substantive changes, particularly in the, uh, the JSOC arena and the classified area. The outgrowth of all this was the Nunn-Cohen Amendment and the Goldwater-Nichols Joint Amendment uh, statutes, forcing the services to finally recognize the necessity of true joint planning and to support JSOC as a much more robust force. Uh, and it was that force eventually that brought you Panama, which was a much smoother, well-planned and uh, well thought out operation that justified uh, both of those two pieces of legislation. And, you know, Grenada uh, made those happen. So I, I think in that sense, the disaster was also a positive. Okay, so we got a couple questions here. If you're ready to take some questions, um, fire away. Okay, well, the first one is from uh, an unnamed attendee. He says he was very young at the time of the Grenada invasion. I remember thinking at the time that the invasion was ridiculous. Giant company, a country invading a small uh, country. 
was it intended to distract from the bad news of the Beirut bombing? Or was it two separate operations? Uh, they were separate and distinct operations. Uh, the force that landed in Grenada was uh, off, was, was loaded back on, and that force, Ray Smith's element, uh, pressed on to Beirut uh, to uh, reoccupy the barracks and reinforce the Marines that were there. But it wasn't other than emotionally a joint program, if you would. Uh, the problem in Grenada was the students and the uh, phone calls that they were sending back to their president in uh, Connecticut and the great concern State Department had for the uh, safety of the students. Uh, that was, you know, one issue, plus the overthrow of Bishop and the clear thuggery that was immediately going on. Plus, there was some classified intelligence in regard to the intent of the Cubans, uh, all of which I'm sure weighed on Reagan when he made the decision on the 23rd, we have to go in to save the students and also block the Cubans from getting into Saline. Um, you mentioned what happened to the POWs at the Red Cross and ultimately uh, evacuated most of them. Uh, the thugs, uh, did you ha hear anything what happened to them long term? Uh, yes. Uh, the Caribbean peacekeeping force uh, built up a local, rebuilt the Grenadian legal structure, if you would, which was English-based. Uh, a number of the judges and lawyers and all that had been uh, basically either in hiding or had exiled themselves when Bishop took over returned. And the legal structure was fairly quickly uh, reinstated. Uh, and a number of trials were held in Grenada with these uh, folks that we had policed up. I can't give you numbers, but I do know that they went on for over two years uh, until all of the folks that we had policed up, plus others uh, that came later, were taken care of. So this next question uh, you, uh, really looks forward a bit. You commanded the assault force in Panama. Highlight some of the changes that you saw in doctrine and in coordination that made the invasion of Panama much more effective. God, I was, I want to correct, I was not an assault force okay. commander in Panama. Uh, I was the, call it the uh, reconstitution office that came okay. in with them. Uh, slight difference in nuance and the in force of application. Uh, totally different planning. Uh, Blue Spoon, which was the initial internal planning doctrine for uh, pl op plan for Panama, was done a year plus in advance. The forces were assigned. They knew it well in advance of the actual invasion itself. Many rehearsals were held on light terrain or actually on the terrain through the jungle school, the uh, various, the three lock zones, the airfields. Uh, we had extensive reconnaissance by force commanders and intelligence folks throughout the island. We had a complete plan in place uh, well before the actual invasion itself took place. Uh, that was planned, it was rehearsed, the parts were all assembled. Uh, you know, it was just a very smooth piece of work under General Steiner uh, and Thurman uh, compared to what we had to go through in uh, Grenada. In a sense, it was a, a maturation of, of uh, the planning capabilities of our armed forces over that period of time from uh, um, the invasion of Grenada. Uh, absolutely. You had uh, Joint Special Operations Command under uh, General Downing uh, sitting next to General Steiner and General Thurman at the Quarry Heights Tunnel. You had the conventional forces also being worked, and you had the same uh, G 
G J3, if you would, and General Hartzog, who was orchestrating the whole thing, but they were all in one room. They had worked the plans together and they were executing all the plans together. Okay. So anything else you'd like to add in closing? Uh, well, it's, it's ironic, you know, out of uh, Desert One uh, grew special ops and uh, uh, capturing Osama bin Laden. The other disaster, JSOC, uh, the other disaster that was suffered by JSOC was uh, <clears throat> uh, Grenada. And it was because of all the planning issues that we had Goldwater Nichols and Nunn Cohen and basically retribution and reconstitution as a result of both Desert One and Grenada brought us where we are today. So even though they're two took place at two totally different times and different circumstances, the confluence is what brought us to where we are today. And, you know, I, I think we, we need to recognize the value of both of those operations, uh, neither of which would be considered neat by anybody's description. Well, sir, I want to thank you for speaking to us tonight, and uh, hopefully we can chat sometime again in the future. Happy to do so.